Hello and welcome to the page. If you're new here, go ahead and like and subscribe. My name is Ryan Beals. I'm a CPA. I'm going to try to talk about tax topics that are specific to certain industries. Today we're going to talk about taxes for real estate professionals, in particular real estate agents, brokers, and realtors. So about me, my name is Ryan Beals again. I'm a CPA, a certified public accountant. I have about eight years in doing taxes. Graduated from Midwestern State University. That's in Wichita Falls, Texas. It's close to the border of Oklahoma. I currently live in League City. I've been in the Houston area now for five plus years. And I run a business called Brian Beal CPA PLC. We specialize in doing small business tax, but we also do individuals and trust. We specialize in trying to have the complete package uh, for all the accounting needs for small business as far as doing the tax return, the payroll, and IRS representation, doing forecasting, everything that a small business might need, we try to take care of all of that at once. All right, so let's talk about realtors taxes. And more specifically, taxes specific to the realtors individual taxes. So if, if you're a realtor, most likely you're self-employed. So what does that mean? It means instead of having an employer who is in charge of where you are and where you should be and getting a W-2 and have your payroll withheld from your paycheck, such as you know your typical payroll taxes and your federal income tax, none of that is being withheld. It's all on yourself. You'll receive a 1099 at the end of the year, and that'll show the income that you're responsible for. It also means that you're in charge of tracking your own income and expenses. You're responsible for paying estimated taxes. Taxes are due periodically throughout the year and it's very wise to be paying these and being on top of it so that you don't have a big lump sum at the end of the year and owe taxes and penalties. You're also subject to self-employment tax, something that is already included when you're a W-2 employee is behind the scenes. It, your payroll is either being withheld or it's being paid by your employer. So let's talk about tracking income expenses. So first things first, if you are keeping your expenses separate in the most, in the easiest way that you can have separation is by having separate bank accounts, it's that easy. If you don't have a separate bank account for your business, then I highly recommend that you start right away. It's very important because it's not only is it easier to track your income expenses when it's only one bank account, but it also provides a layer of separation that if the IRS questions what you have, you can say, no, this is what everything I have for my business. This is my personal account. And there's a lot of issues when it comes in and you and when people only have one bank account, it, it provides more trouble than it's worth. So, I highly advise having separate bank accounts. So let's talk about some common expenses. So mileage we'll talk about more later. Commissions paid. A lot of times you may end up having to pay commissions to another real estate agent. If it's not already included or adjusted for in your 1099, this is something that's deductible on your return. Home office and desk fees, we'll talk about that in a bit. Education and training. If there is a if there's any kind of fees for attending a class or a training for your job, then that's also deductible. Then marketing and advertising. Anytime that you're out there making flyers, marketing events, anytime you're trying to sell your business, that's also deductible. Office supplies and equipment. It's pretty self-explanatory. Things like you know your staples, um, your equipment like computer, meals. There's a special thing with meals. So there's a few different exceptions. So for meals, if you are going to see a client to talk business, or if you're doing any kind of networking, that is 50% deductible. However, there are times when it's fully deductible. So the most common thing that comes up where it's fully deductible would be Christmas parties. If it is a, an event where all the employees are taking part in this at once, then that is something that's 100% deductible. Also included in this is entertainment. Entertainment is not deductible at all, 0%. So 
things like entertainment would be like going to a baseball game or going to top golf. If it's not something that the entire office is taking part in, it's typically not deductible. Next, we have license and dues and membership fees. So for myself, I have to pay dues to the AICPA and the Texas State Board. That's due every year, and that's deductible. So if there's a equivalent for that, you would have that would be deductible on your return. Insurance. Now there's two different insurances that need to be separated. You have your general liability insurance, which is like if you get sued, or you know, hurricane insurance, or you know, insurance that's not related to health is fully deductible. But health insurance is deductible on a different part of the return. We'll talk about that later. Software, so any kind of software that, so if you downloaded QuickBooks and you subscribed, that would be deductible. Gifts, there's also a special tax code for this. $25 per item is deductible. And usually that means per person too. So if you go out and you give gifts and they're over $25, you have to limit that to $25. So if it's $30, you can only deduct $25, I think. And then cell phone. I, Typically, in this, you would have a cell phone, and it would be for both personal and it would be for business use, and you would just take a percentage, and it would have to be a conversation between you and the CPA to know what percentage is reasonable. So let's talk about how to record expenses. So there's multiple ways to do this, but my preferred way is to have a software such as QuickBooks. QuickBooks is very powerful in that it has a lot of functions that are very convenient for self-employed. It can do everything as far as track your mileage. It can also do things like you can connect your bank account and easily track expenses and income that way. Another way would be Excel spreadsheets. You would get your bank account, your bank statements at the end of the month, and then just go through line by line and categorize it in an Excel spreadsheet. And then you can also do a shoebox way, which I do not recommend. Hardly anybody I know is that good at keeping all the receipts, but some people are. If the, the, the problem with the shoebox is that it's, it's very unorganized. People tend to just throw stuff in there. You buy a lot of stuff online and it's reoccurring. So if you're looking for the most complete way, the shoebox method is probably not the best way, but if that's the way you operate, more power to you. So let's talk about business mileage. This is one of the most tedious things to calculate during the year, and not everybody is the best at calculating this, and this is why apps like QuickBooks is so great in that it automatically calculates for you. It asks the, at the end of each trip, was that business or not? And you just said yes or no, and it, and it does everything behind the scenes for you. Um, as far as the actual amount, this is something that is adjusted each year. I believe this is something that's done by Congress. Um, usually it goes up, but this is one of the rare years where it actually goes down. Um, last year it was more per mile. Um, it is less this year. Um, business miles is, are miles only for business purposes. So what does that mean? It means the miles that begin from your regular place of business. So if that is the, your office, then miles from the office to your place that you're trying to go for business and back it does not mean from your house. It also means that if you diverge somewhere and you go to get tacos, you go either way to get food or something like that, that portion is not deductible. So only miles that are used for business. Okay, so home office deduction. So my understanding is that a lot of real estate agents pay a desk fee, and that's their fee for having a desk at an establishment. If you're paying this desk fee, then most likely you're not eligible for a home office deduction. But if you're not, that opens up a lot of space for you to take this deduction. And there's two different ways you can deduct it. You can either take a square footage and you get a standard rate based on the square footage, or you take the square footage and compare it to your house square footage in total and you would take expenses that are related to your house, such as um, mortgage interests, your property taxes, any kind of utilities, and expenses that are directly related to it, such as if you have dedicated internet, or if you have a phone that's dedicated to it, and you would take these expenses 
and put them in as a percentage to your square footage, and that's what would go to your home office deduction. Your home office deduction also is something that needs to be a principal place of business. If this is, like I said, if, the, if, if you are paying for a desk fee and you have a main desk somewhere else, then you're not eligible for this, for this home office deduction. So health insurance is another area of the tax code that has some special circumstances. So health insurance includes premiums for medical, dental, and qualifying long-term care. It's also subject to earned income limitations. So that means that you can't take health, health, health insurance can't take you into a loss, unlike expenses on a Schedule C. Once it gets to zero, health insurance is also zero. It can't give you a loss. Things that are excluded are life insurance. So let's talk about some basic tax planning. One of the biggest areas for tax planning is these estimated tax payments. It's very crucial to be making these estimated payments throughout the year to avoid estimated tax penalties and interest at the end of the year. So if you were to just disregard these payments and pay at the very end of the year, so if you were to pay it on April 15th of this next year, you would owe a large amount of penalties and interest because taxes were due throughout the year, you just didn't pay them. Retirement accounts are a really easy way to save some money on taxes while also benefiting yourself by shoving as much money into these retirement accounts as possible. So let's, let's run through some examples right quick. So a simplified employee pension, or a SEP as it's commonly called, you can put to the lesser of 25% of net self-employment income or $58,000. The best thing about a SEP is that you can make contributions after year end. So these other plans, you can't make contributions to once the year ends, your opportunity to contribute is over. But you can contribute all the way up until the due date of return. And if it's extended, you have all the way of October into the following year to make contributions to the SEP. A 401k has similar rules, but it, once the year end is over, you can no longer contribute. And a 401k should really be thought of as two different ways. You have you as a employee and you as the owner. So you as the employee can contribute 19,500. And if you're over the age of 50, you can contribute 6,500 on top of that. And just like the SEP, you can make, you can make additional contributions to the lesser of 25% of self-employment income or $58,000. So that would be the amount that you can contribute as you, the owner. One downside, if you have a lot of employees, you need to really consider um, whether a 401k is worth it because you can have, you, you're subject to discrimination testing. And last but not least is a savings incentive match plan for employees, a simple IRA plan. The IRS and the government love to make these acronyms. It's, it feels like they're everywhere. Anyways, so what's nice about a savings incentive match plan for employees or simple IRA plan is that you can contribute all of your net earnings from self-employment up to 13,500. So as opposed to 401k and the SEP, it's 25%, but it's all of your earnings. So let's say that you had $5,000 in earnings, 25% is like a couple thousand, but 5,000 in the simple is, is almost twice as much in that situation. So really it's nice to have a variety of these and it, they all have their, their quirks about them and what makes them better in certain situations. So one of the most common questions in general I get from people that are running their own business in general who are just starting out is, should I be in an S corporation? And this is such a hard question because the answer I always have to give is it depends. There are so many variables that go into this that it's, it's hard just to make a blanket statement because everyone's different. Everyone has a different reasonable salary. But let's talk about some of the things that make S corporations unique and why someone might want to be in an S corporation. So for tax purposes, and there's legal reasons too, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'd prefer not to get into that. But for 
tax purposes, one of the main reasons why people get into an S corporation is there is no self-employment tax. However, you do have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. So whatever that reasonable salary is, that is the amount of which is due for payroll taxes. So instead of having 100% subject to self-employment tax, you would have that portion that's cut out for reasonable salary you would pay payroll tax on. But the amount that it's paid towards your wages is deductible on your business. So there is a little bit of a yin and a yang on that. S corporations can also have multiple shareholders. And one thing that is on the downside of S corporations is there is increased administrative cost. So as far as hiring a CPA like myself to do it, it does cost more. If there is increased bookkeeping costs to make sure that everything's right. Um, as far as distributions and income, everything has to be handled a certain way. And if there's not, there's issues that come along with that. So everything needs to be kosher to say, and keeping everything right does come with its cost. Okay, so here is a quick breakdown of just a really simple, I've done, there's math inside of the math here. So try not to get hung up on the numbers themselves because this is just a general, just to show you why it's beneficial. And then after this, I have a situation where it didn't go so well. So let's talk about this. So in this situation, you have a Schedule C. In both situations, there's revenue of 150,000. There's expenses of 50,000. So when you're not talking about wages, $100,000 worth of income. But on the S Corp, you have wages that are being paid to you of $50,000 so that ends up being $50,000 net, net income. So again, try not to get caught up in the numbers too much here on the bottom, but there's math inside the math. There's calculations within the calculations. So for the Schedule C, just talking about the business income. Taxable income would be 55,148, and on the S corporation side is 66,000. You're paying 14,130 in self-employment tax along with 6,237 of total tax. Over on the S corp side, you'd have payroll tax just on the wages, 7,650. See, it's half as much there, but you do pay a little bit more in income tax, 7,539 for a savings just over $5,000. And this right here is the key as to why someone would choose to be in an S corporation. Yeah, there's more administrative duties and costs associated with that, but when it's right, you can save yourself a lot in taxes. But, you know, as they say, the sun doesn't always shine. So let's take a look at when it doesn't always go right. Here we have a situation where it's almost identical. We took away $20,000 off the top of our revenue, so $130,000 in the expenses are still the same. And we also increased wages by $15,000. So if you look in the same scenario, decreased revenue, increased wages. So it's about $35,000 swing total. Um, but you see in the taxes down here in the bottom, self-employment tax, 11304 and income tax of 4,452 for a total of 15,756. Over on the S corporation side, $71,000 in taxable income and payroll tax of 9,945. And see the difference there between the 9,000 and almost 10,000 and 11,000? There's the big difference. And income tax over on the S corp side, almost $6,000 for 15,924. And in this case, you actually didn't help yourself at all. You actually made it worse by being an S corporation. So this really shows why it is so important that this is not something I recommend that you do by yourself. And if you do do it by yourself, you should do some research and make sure this is something you actually wanna be in. If not, you need to contact a tax professional and make sure that this isn't happening to you because you're losing money on this and you haven't even paid your CPA like me yet. Uh, assuming that you do have a CPA, so don't let this happen to you. So we've covered common tax issues related to the individual's return for the real estate agent, but let's talk about questions that you might be getting in the field. So I'm sure there's more than this, but these are the main ones that I can think of to take an educated guess. If there is more questions that you'd like to hear, leave a comment below and I'll try to make a separate video and address those. 
So before we begin, let's lay some groundwork here. So what is a gain? A gain occurs when an asset is sold for more than its basis. Well, what is the basis? A basis in general is how much you paid for that property plus any kind, any kind of investments you've put into it. So let's say you bought a house and then you put a pool in it. So the amount that you paid for the pool is included in the basis and it adds to it. Things that are more of like just to keep the house as it is aren't included in the basis. So really it has to be improvements somehow. So adding on to your house, adding a pool, adding on some sort of extra structure. So if you got any of those, it's it's great to keep track of those because especially here in the Houston area, there are places where you, you could see some outrageous gains, especially if you've held it for 10 plus years. I can only imagine some of the gains that's out there. Okay, so let's talk about types of gains and specifically capital gains. So capital gains are usually put into two kinds of categories. They're either long term, which means that you sold it for over a year of what you purchased it. So let's say, in other words, if you purchased it, you held it for more than a year and then you sold it. That is a long term gain. And the opposite of that would be a short term gain. You bought something and you sold it within a year. This is important because there are different tax rates for this. Long-term gains have a preferential tax bracket, and it's usually 0, 15, 20%, and the amounts fluctuate, depends on the year, who's in office, you know. Um, Short-term assets do not get any preferential brackets. They are taxed just like normal income, just like your wages or business income. There is no beneficial brackets. So now that we've laid some groundwork, let's talk about some questions that you might be getting. So first question, will I owe taxes if I sell my home? And the answer to that is it depends. It depends on what you got going on. So a combination of how much gain you have and your filing status. So let's look at this first one. So if you owned and occupied your home for two of the past five years, you could qualify for an exclusion of 250,000 if you're single and 500,000 for married filing jointly. So in other words, if you had a gain of 600,000 and you're married filing jointly, 500 of that gain doesn't is disallowed. There's an exclusion on that and you don't have to pay taxes on that portion. So only $100,000 would you pay taxes on. You can see the benefit of that. Also, you may qualify for a partial exclusion. So work-related move. So if you were to move 50 miles further for a job, so here in Houston, that would be like clear across from the south side all the way up to the north side, it would be a pretty substantial move. Uh, it'd be, if it's 50 miles or, or more, you may qualify for a, a uh, partial exclusion. Another thing is health-related move. So an example I can give for here in Houston. So here in Houston, we have one of the best medical centers in the world. It's not unusual for people to come here from all, all over the world and to come here often and periodically. So let's say that you had something with something going on and you need to be near the hospital all the time. If you were to move, if you were, move, were to move for a medical reason, you would be there's a good chance you would qualify for a partial exclusion. Another way you could have a partial exclusion is an unforeseeable event. That includes if your house was destroyed, such as like a hurricane. Here in Houston, where's, you know, a hurricane could blow through at any time and it could destroy a lot of houses. And that's a reason, that's another way you could get a partial exclusion. Another way is becoming, if you or your spouse or a family member had passed away, you became divorced or legally separated, gave birth to two or more children at the same time. So if you had twins, triplets, or beyond, you're eligible for a partial exclusion from the IRS. You became eligible for unemployment compensation, so you're let go, or became unable because of change in unemployment status to pay basic living expenses. So those are some ideas of what an unforeseeable event would be. So the next question, are property taxes and mortgage interest deductible? And the 
answer to that is, again, it depends. Let's take a look. So property taxes and mortgage interests are grouped together with other itemized deductions. So that includes things like donations and medical expenses. And the sum of those items are compared against the standard deduction. The standard deduction is something that is that changes every year. So for married filing jointly, it's somewhere about $24,000. So the sum of all of your itemized deductions would have to be more than your standard deduction. And the higher, the higher amount is what you would take. So, and there's, there's times when you would be paying personal property tax and mortgage interest and donations and medical expenses and still not be itemizing. So I'll give you an example, my first home I bought in Wichita Falls and I, I bought that house for less than $100,000 total. So my mortgage interest and my property taxes were almost nothing. And the sum of all those expenses added up to where it's, it still wasn't more than the standard deduction. So I never itemized. And last but not least, do I qualify for a 1031 exchange? So again, this is a maybe, but if you're in the works of buying and selling personal properties, so like residence, um, houses that are being lived in by this individual, um, hardly ever is this going to qualify for you. It's always going to be business property and investment property. So it must be a like kind properties, which my understanding is that the uh, definition of like kind is pretty liberal in the eyes of the IRS, but must be property held for business or investment purposes. So like a rental would be an example. Um, these, the sale is also subject to timing rules on the replacement of the property. So there's a 45 day rule and there's a 180 day rule to where you would need to find the property and then also close on it within a certain amount of time. And again, personal residence and vacation homes generally do not qualify. And that's all I have for this presentation. If you have any more questions, feel free to drop a comment down below. And if there's enough to accumulate, I'll make a separate video for that. So if you liked what you heard today, be sure to like and follow so you can see more videos in the future. My name is Ryan Beals. I'm a CPA and I do taxes. My website is ryanbillcpa.com. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. That's it. That's all I got for today. Have a good one, guys.